out a whole line. But if you take out just the origin, I haven't yet convinced you, but I shall in a second, that it can't be exact. On the other hand, this formula that holds everywhere except x equals 0 tells you that if you take d again, you get 0. And then by continuity, if, of course, you can just do the calculation of d. If you take, take your product rule and do it. But this means d omega is 0 on r2 minus the x-axis. And that implies d omega is 0 on r2 minus the origin. Why? Well, if it's 0 on the whole thing. Well, well the origin has I, I would, I would, I would think backwards. Yeah. yeah. Well, no, I, I meant what I said. Is this person C1 on its domain? Yeah. So that means the derivative is continuous. If the derivative is 0 everywhere except the x-axis, what is it on points of the x-axis that are in the domain? It has to be 0 by continuity. Or just take the derivative. I mean, just do the, I don't want to waste your time with that, but just take the derivative and you can see it's 0. All right, now you, I'm going to convince you it can't be you confused. So I'm not going to convince you it's not exact. So we call, we, we said, we did this calculation in fact, I'm going to just change it to closed interval here. Take the parameterized curve that goes around the unit circle. Remember? Oops, that's terrible. All right, let's try that. Mapping the interval to R2, given by going around the unit circle. We did the calculation of the pullback. Remember we plugged in minus sine t times minus sine t dt plus cosine t cosine t dt all over cosine squared plus sine squared, and we got dt. Now, suppose omega were exact. on R2 minus 0. So this is just fancy notation for smooth function on R2 minus 0. Suppose, F were, suppose you had an F and a maker were DF. What if we, what's one of our properties that we're going to prove today? DDF is 0. True. What's another property relating to the pullback? So one of the properties which I'm going to prove to today is that the pullback of d somebody is d of the pullback. Now what is the pullback of a function? It's fog. So if omega were exact, the pullback of omega to the interval 0 to 2 pi would likewise be exact. You see something wrong? What would happen now, think back to our whole motivation for pullback that you want to do substitution. What would be the integral of the function f composed with g prime. I mean, 
mean, that's what this thing is, right? This thing is, take the derivative. But what does the fundamental theorem of calculus tell you? It's f composed of g evaluated as the positive two pi. So what do you get when you do that? So we're composing arc tan with. No, 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 no. This f has nothing to do with this. Oh, okay. Is well, isn't g the same at 0 and 2 pi? So you get just, what, I don't know what f is, but you get the same thing. So f of 0, 1 second, 1 0. Right. Everybody hear what David said? This is f at g of 2 pi minus f at g of 0, but then be the same point. So you get f at point minus f at same point, which is zero. Well, that's very interesting. But what, did, what does this have to do with this? Well, at g pullback of omega is supposed to be what we just here, but g pullback of omega is supposed to be dt. So this is supposed to equal the interval from 0 to 2 pi of dt, which as you may said is 2 pi. So we have the well-known fact that 2 pi equals 0. <laughs> <laughs> you thought 1 equals 0 was the mathematical truth of your lives. Well, now it's, you're gonna, for the rest of the semester, it's going to be 2 pi equals 0. It's just going to make proof so much easier. <laughs> so where do we get the, that should equal 2 pi? Because we said if you pulled back omega, it was the form dt. Yes. This is dt. No, no, yeah, but what, where, does, where, where do we have that it should equal 2 pi? So just t from Integrate dt from 0 to 2 pi. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. All right, so this phenomenon, the 2 pi equals 0, is going to manifest itself in various ways for the rest of the semester. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> You'll even have 4 pi of 0 as well. So then to finish, we say that can't happen, happen, therefore. It yeah, so this is a contradiction. So it contradicts the suppose omega we're exact. So the conclusion is omega cannot be exact on all of our two moments. It was g pullback omega um, equal dt. Um, that was, we just did it. We did it. I, I, I talked you through it again. You yeah. just literally pulled back. All right, now there was another one that showed up on web work that I didn't alert you to. And I'll use a different letter just because. So now I'm going to take a, an analogous two form on R3 minus the R. And unfortunately, our physics major is missing. So this one is crucial for physics, as you're going to see after spring break. But does this look familiar from? Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't even have to finish writing? You do. Yeah. Because you, you just put a variable and then d of the other thing is wedged. In the appropriate order. Yeah. And then divided by something. So the analog of this. So a property that this had that I didn't stop to emphasize is what would have happened if I had done this on a circle 
of not just radius 1, but radius A. Suppose I put an A in there and, and parameterize a circle that was larger or smaller. What would the pullback have been then? Don't guess. Do it. No, it's just going to be the same. Why? Because you get an A in the, DX, in the D's and an A in the X and Y's on top, and then you get A squared on the bottom. Right. So it's going to be homogeneous at degree zero. If you scale X and Y by A, <laughs> this scales by A, this scales by A. So numerator scales by A squared, denominator scales, scales by A squared. So even with an A here, you don't see the radius when you look at this form. Do you think something analogous is happening here? If you scale x, y, and z by a, what happens in the numerator? You get a cube. You get an a cubed. What you get in the denominator? A cubed. a cubed. So notice that like omega above, c doesn't change when we scale the x vector by a positive scale. If we want to scale one component, I would no, that won't. Then it messes up. Okay. I'm scaling the whole vector. So I don't know if you guys actually did this computation when you were doing web work, but you should have found out that d of this is zero. But some of you did it on my board. <coughs> is there a better way to see this that might, say, be analogous to what was going on here? If we could prove it was exact, then we know it was uh -huh. well, Well, somehow what I'm suggesting with this parameterization here is the polar coordinates is relevant. What we, what we discussed here is that if you put a radius in there and an angle, that this turns out just to be D of the angle. If you pull back. What should I think about doing in R3? So if you took the parameterization g of rho phi theta and did spherical coordinates, so I'm actually going to put the radius in there even though I've already argued it's irrelevant. So you of course all remember spherical coordinates, rho sine phi cosine theta, rho sine phi sine theta, rho cosine phi. It doesn't seem like much fun, but you could compute the derivative of G, write down the derivative matrix, and you could pull back this stuff without it being so horrendous. Now, I'm going to tell you the answer. I'm not going to go through it all. And I'm going to show you how you might have figured it out. A bit of computation. Just a bit. It's not bad. And you'll be doing lots of stuff like this after spring break. The pullback of C is the following two form. Sine of phi d phi wedge d theta. Does this ring a bell? Again, it, again. Kind of, it kind of reminds it reminds me a little bit of the form we had to, to use to integrate. Um, yeah, in fact, the recall if you pulled back the volume three form dx which ui which dz, 
when you were doing integrals with spherical coordinates, as I'm going to explain later today, you're doing change of variables when you do pullback. This is going to be what you would expect the dv to be in spherical coordinates, which as Gabe is remembering, is this. And if you actually, where does the fudge factor come from? <coughs> what did we prove when we proved the change of variables theorem? Where does the fudge factor well, that's come from? The, um, the determinant of determinant of the Jacobian matrix, of the derivative. This is the determinant of dg. And that's exactly how pulling back the 3 form is going to give you the determinant of the whole 3 by 3 derivative matrix times the wedge of d rho d c d theta. Sorry, I think I missed something going back. How do we get that, we recall that the pullback of dx dy dz? Because because the, well, you were the one that recognized so what dv factor. looked like in spherical coordinates. Yeah. I'm saying that what we now have is that if you do the pullback of this creature, you're going to get exactly the determinant of the derivative matrix. That's what we were doing on Friday. We were doing two by two sub matrices. If you're doing okay. the whole three form, you're going to get the whole determinant of the derivative matrix times d rho, which d and this, well, what, where did the row squared go? Well, the row squared went away because I divided by row cubed here. And I had an x in here and a y in here and a z in here, so there were no rows. Now, what's perhaps not so clear is where the d row went. But let me remind you of something you did with your homework. If I took three vectors, sorry, two vectors, sorry, two vectors, right? This is a two form. If I put two vectors into C, what am I going to get? Well, I'm going to get one over rho cubed. This is rho squared to the three halves. Then I'm going to take x times dy wedge dz, so I'm going to take the vector x in the first column, and then I'm claiming I'm going to get v1 in the second column and v2 in the third column. This should be reminding you of one of the homework problems you're turning in whenever it is. Do you see why this is right? If you plug in v1, v2, taking x times the yz part of this determinant. Plus y times the determinant with these two rows, except in the zx order. In other words, you're doing minus y times this determinant. Plus z times this determinant. So when you put those all together, you're getting the determinant of this 3 by 3, where you take the x vector in the first column and the v1 and the v2 in the second two columns. Well, think about properties of determinants. Do you care about any part of v1 and v2 that are have a component in the x vector direction? No. All you care about is how much of v1 and v2 are in the plane perpendicular to x. Well, what does that look like? What's the plane perpendicular to x? All the vectors normal to x, which means it's like thinking of x as a point on a sphere and looking at the tangent plane of the sphere. So, so this is only caring about vectors that are tangent to the sphere at x, which makes you think about how it's only going to depend on the sphere part and not on the row part. So I'm not going to spend the 20 minutes belaboring all the details here. But 
this is actually reasonable that when you do this computation, you do get this because I'm claiming that the, there's not going to be any d row terms because of this geometry. And the coefficient of d phi wedge d theta should be exactly what is coming out of this thing when you're taking rho to be a constant. So we'll do a lot more with this form. Trust me, you're going to see this for weeks. Mm -hmm. This is a more mundane mechanical question, but when we're applying, like, when we took C of V1, V2, mm -hmm. um, the output of that should be a real should, number. Should be a real number. Um, De depends on x, y, and z. It depends on x, y, and z. So it's basically a function of x, y, and z. Mm -hmm. So x, y, and z we don't plug anything in for, but for d, for, but for like d, y, and d, z we're choosing. You you the choosing vectors of phi, but you could do you could compute this at a point and put in numbers for x, y, and z. Right. Okay. All right. I want to get to the punchline before I now do the proofs, though. Looking at this formula, can you guess if pullback of C is exact? So you have this formula. Oh, great. No, not the chalks, not erasing again. So, given the formula, is this exact, is this two form exact on R3 minus the R? It's clear that it's closed. If you take D of this, you get zero. Right? Because there's yeah. Only a function of phi, and d phi is already there. So d of it is zero. Can you guess a one form whose derivative is this? Good, Cameron. If I take d of that, what do I get? like it worked. But, does this really make sense on all of our 3 minus 0? We got d theta here. T was theta. So, Mr. Mama is highly perceptive here. He lucked out. This thing is really not defined everywhere. d theta is this one form, and that is not defined where z is zero. So this is going to be a perfectly nice one form on R3, but it's not defined on the whole z-axis. Because on the whole z-axis, you are dividing by zero. So what have we now argued? Well, we've argued that it is exact if you remove the whole z-axis. But we will see later. I can't prove it to you today. But something analogous to this argument will show that it's not exact everywhere, except the argument. So we have established. Walk on the z axis where x equals 0. x and y. Oh, z, yes. Right, z axis is where this denominator is 0. 
Where did we get the detail? Was that? That's what I said. I, I know you just said it. Because this T here is theta. Right. So in polar coordinates, this form pulls back to be d theta. But now, in polar up. coordinates here are sitting inside of spherical coordinates. The, d, the theta in spherical coordinates is the polar coordinates theta. Right, but we said the d theta was the pullback of omega by g, whereas you're just saying it is. No, the, uh, no, no, no. This is the pullback by spherical coordinates, which it has polar coordinates sitting inside it. Okay. Right. When you do when you do spherical coordinates, this theta is the polar coordinate theta. All right, we're going to do lots more with this going forward. I just wanted to leave it at that for now. Okay. So, as I feared, I'm not going to quite finish everything today. All right, so what's, what's on the docket for now and the beginning of tomorrow is to polish off the proofs of everything. So, proofs of all the properties. So I have a, what do I have? I have product rule for wedging two forms. I have D of D and I have D of pullback. So you might just say, okay, I'll, I'll pretend I'm an engineer or a physicist and I don't care about proofs. So you, you're not obliged to pay attention. But these proofs are not particularly hard, but I just have to do them. All right, so. Will you be responsible for those proofs for the first day? No. I might ask something related to this on the final hour. So, suppose, suppose omega is a K form, and phi is an L form. I want to claim that the derivative of their wedge product is this product rule that you take the derivative, whoops, phi, Ted, phi. Do you make a wedge phi plus this funny minus sign that appears? Jeez, make a wedge d phi. Okay, so this is the first one we want to prove. All right, so without loss of generality, Omega can be written as a sum of functions times d x thingies. So let's just take one of those, because we already know that d of a sum is the sum of the d's. So I'm going to, it suffices to consider omega is just some function times a dx of i multi-index. Again, in general, it's a sum of such things, but I'm just going to take one, and phi would be a function times dx sub multi-index j, where the agreement here is that i has length k and j has length l. All right. So follow your notes. That's a k Hmm? So what's omega which phi? F times g? Yep. Dxi j? Yep. So it's F dxi wedge g dxj. And the rule for that, as Daniel just said, is you multiply the coefficients. And then you have the concatenated multi-index here. You just multiply function like that? Yeah. And at each point, this is a number and this is a number, and numbers don't have any issues with, with wedges. All right. How do you do a derivative of a product of two functions? Product rule. That's what I've done. Of course. <laughs> so the rule here for taking the derivative of a function times a dx thingy 
is you take the derivative of the function wedge the dx thingy. Mm -hmm. So I have a function that happens to be an amalgamation, happens to be a product of two functions. I have to take the root of that product function times dx thingy. E. I take the root of the function, wedge the dx. E. <coughs> That's our definition of how we define d. That's what you've been doing on all your web work, and that's what we did on Friday. Well, what is d of f g? It's f. It's g times df plus f times dg. So the usual product rule holds for partial derivatives. And so it holds for the exterior derivative, one partial derivative at a time. So for the ith partial, this is the right formula, where this is the ith partial, this is the ith partial. You put them all together with the dx's. All right, so now you see where we're headed. I want to now take this thing and break it into two pieces that are going to correspond to these two things. Say what you mean, Jonathan. What? Say it. So what do you mean? Could we G then DF and then we have F and DG instead of G and DF. So we want to put them on similar sides. Still not quite understanding what you mean. But let's do the first term here. How can I rewrite this? Well, I can rewrite this as this. And then just stick the dxj on the final end. You agree? dxij I can split back to being the wedge product. Put the dxi with the df, parentheses. Remember, remember wedging is associative. So here is my d omega. And where's my phi? Well, the g. Now that Cameron's going to complain again, but g is just a scalar. So I can move him, and this is, I think, what Jonathan meant a minute ago. I can move him back where he belongs so I see phi again. It's a, it's a scalar, so moving him across wedge doesn't do anything. It's just a number at each point. So this is going to be d omega wedge phi. I'm OK with that piece. Do you see what I have to do here? I'm going to do the same thing of writing the wedge out, but now what do I want to do? Now, who knows? Will, what, 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 what do I want to switch? You want, to, you want your dxj to go with the dg. I do, but I don't want to destroy the order that omega and phi appeared in. So what switcheroo do I want to do here? Do you want to move DG? Move DG. There you go. I want to switch those two. Because if I switch these two, I'll have the FDXI together, and I'll have the DG with the DXJ. What does it take to switch these two? K. One times K, right? So this is going to be minus one to the one times K otherwise known as k, f dxi wedge dg wedge dxk. So now I've got my d phi here, and I've got my omega here. So there it is. Everybody OK? All right, rule number two.
So by the way, the special case was where one, where the first one was a function. So if k is zero, then this is the formula that I wrote down for the easy product rule when k is zero. Okay. Second rule, d of d. So start with any k form, d it, d it again, you get zero. When I looked at this, I imagine thinking like omega can only be like C2, and that you can have like two derivatives, and then zero, and then you can have like done. No, 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 it's not that the derivatives disappear. So even if omega is only C2, you still get two derivatives, but I'm confused. Because how, well, well, think of a trick function. If you take two derivatives, it's just not zero, even though the function is C2. Uh, right, 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 right. I mean, why? Like after two derivatives, it's always zero. No, 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 but it's not that the derivatives become zero if you ignore the differential forms. It's the differential forms that makes it work. So let's do it, let's do it, let's do a first case. Let's say k is zero. So this is actually what Davis is thinking about, I think. Suppose you start with a function. I think I have room to do this here, but I might not quite. Suppose I start with a function f, and I take d of df. That's d of, what's the definition of df? Partials times the d's. Okay, partials times corresponding d's, dx's. Now, what's the rule for how I take d of such a thing? So it's going to be partials. d of the partial times wedge for the dx i. Okay, so you take the coefficient function which happens to be a partial derivative, but that doesn't matter. And then you take that and you wedge it with what was the dx that was sitting there, just like what we're doing here. All right, so here's what Davis was thinking about, I believe. How do I take d of a partial? So I'm now going to have a double sum here. This is a sum on i here, and for each i, how do I take the derivative of the partial respect to xi? It would be the second partial okay. times the d sub j's. Okay, so I'm going to take the second partial with respect to xj, xi, and then multiply by dxj. You guys with me? Right, I'm taking the partials of the thing that has an i in it, so I'm going to use a new letter. So I'm going to take the jth derivative times dxj, and then, so that's this, and then I'm going to wage with dxi, and then I'm going to sum over i and j. You see what's going on now? Well, I know, I know you do, Will. Any volunteers? So what is Davis recalling is true about <coughs> these guys? Switch them around. Switch the order of... So if you switch i and j, you get the same thing. So this is symmetric because, because our functions, we're assuming smooth here, C infinity, but there's certainly C2. Okay? So if I switch i and j, this thing stays the same. What happens if I switch i and j there? So what do you think is going to happen? It's so all going to turn into zero. Wait, wasn't switching the negative one to the k? One. The one dx sub single symbol. So when you switch two one forms, you get minus one to the one times one, which is right. So yeah, these this is very important, Cameron. Okay? These are this is a single dx. It's a, it's a one form. This is a single dx, it's a one form. So if I switch these, I get a minus sign. So how do I write this out? Do you all see what's going on? For any particular coefficient here, you would have the, the same coefficient with a j i here as you have when you switch those two and have an i and a j. But when you switch these two, you get a negative. 
So you get one times it plus negative one times it, they cancel. How do I write that officially? So, first of all, if you have two numbers i and j that are both going from 1 to n, Imagine a square here. This is the i axis and this is the j axis. We're summing over all i's and j's, so I've got n squared terms here. What happens on the diagonal when i equals j? It's zero. We get dxi wedge dxi, which is zero. So when i equals j, nothing happens here. So what about if I think about j less than i? If I just sum over the ones where j is less than i, that would be summing over all of these. And what, what do we know is true if you have j less than i? These symbols form a basis for, la for lambda 2. Right? Increasing indices. So if I just sum over j less than i, this is getting all the terms. I just have to remember that when I want the ones up here, I have to relate those two by a minus sum. So if I just sum over j less than i, I get this term. And then what about the term when I put the other term when, when j is not less than i, I have a term up here, what can I do? Well, I can switch them. The coefficient stays the same by symmetry, but I get a minus sign because I've switched to get ij here. So the case where i is less than j is coming from still switching the two indices and then putting a minus sign. So summing over the whole square, I throw out the diagonal because those terms were zero anyway. I do the blue terms, and then for all the red terms, I just switch the order and put in the minus sign. This is zero because f is c two. So that, that's you're not summing j less than i. I'm, I'm just summing where j is less than i. I'm saying the terms where j is bigger than i are negative, and so you're adding them. Are each one of those is in this sum with where I've put, adjusted with the negative. So if I had a dx three wedge dx two term, I'd write it as dx two wedge dx three with a negative. So any time that you had a j bigger than i, it's represented by one of these terms with the negative. Okay, you have to sit down and write out an example for yourself to make sure you understand that. Well, the end of the story for that particular rule fits in what time I have left. How do you do the general case? Yeah, you can like projection. It's easier than that, I think. General case. Take an omega that's a k-form. Write it as a single function times a dx the e. Again, sums are no problem. So I take d omega. And I get the exact same thing we've just done. And then I take D of that. It's U and not A. Hmm? What space is U in? Rn. 
So this is looking like what we just did, except I have a wedge DXI singing there. If I take D again, it's exactly what we just did, except that you have the wedge DX capital I sitting outside. But we already showed in the first case that this is zero. just did it here was we showed that if you took this, we got zero. So this DX side, capital I, is just sitting there minding its own business. It's totally irrelevant. This stuff gives you zero, so you get zero. Okay. So tomorrow...